Sony has been killing it of late with full frame cameras like the A9 III, but we haven't seen a new 6000 series APS-C camera since 2019. The company finally rectified that with the launch of the A6700 last year, and it appears to be worth the wait. For a reasonable $1,400, it addresses nearly everything I disliked about the A6600 by boosting resolution and reducing rolling shutter. At the same time, it's been compared to the FX3 cinema camera as it has the same sensor and video capabilities. Though it's been out a while, I was keen to see if it lived up to that while comparing it to rival Canon and Fujifilm models. It's mostly good news with some bad. Keep watching to see why. I've never really liked Sony's APS-C bodies as they make handling difficult and are uglier than rival Fujifilm cameras. With its latest improvements, Sony at least rectified the handling part. The grip is larger and easier to hold and there's a new control dial on the front so it's easier to use the camera in manual modes and it includes a dedicated photo, video and S&Q dial, each with separate settings. It does lack a joystick though. Menus are a big step up too, with the improved system from recent full frame models. The A6600 is also the first Sony APS-C camera with an articulating display, so it's better for vloggers. The relatively low resolution EVF is a weak point, but it does the job. Another negative is the single card slot, but at least it supports high speed UHS-2 cards this time. Luckily, it has the same large battery as full frame models, which gives it an excellent 570 shot SEPA rating. All of that adds up to a 6000 series camera I'd happily use, rather than dreading it like before. Performance is a mixed bag though. Lossless raw bursts are possible at up to 11 frames per second, either in mechanical or electronic shutter mode. That compares to 15 and 30 frames per second for the similarly priced Canon EOS R7. And it only stores up to 36 compressed raw frames before the buffer fills, compared to 45 on the A6600. Rolling shutter was my main complaint before, but it's now much improved and about as good as you can get without a stacked sensor. It's still present though, so you'll want to use the mechanical shutter for fast moving subjects, like propellers and trains. Fortunately, the autofocus is superb in continuous mode. You'll get reliable results, even with fast moving subjects. And the AI tracking locks onto eyes and faces, ensuring you won't miss important shots of rowdy kids, soccer games, and more. It also works with airplanes, animals, birds, cars or trains, and insects. Unlike Canon's auto system though, you have to tell the A6700 exactly what you're tracking. Once set though, it's unmatched. The five axis in-body stabilization is good, but not great, offering five stops compared to eight on the EOS R7 and seven on the Fuji X-T5. Still, I was able to take sharp photos down to about an eighth of a second. With a new 26 megapixel sensor, the A6700 captures more detail than past 24 megapixel models. It's still lacking compared to the 32.5 megapixel Canon R7 and 40 megapixel X-T5. Colors are mostly spot on, but I still prefer Canon skin tones. JPEGs look good out of the camera, if a touch over sharpened. With 14-bit raw uncompressed files, I found plenty of room to adjust and tweak images, dialing down bright areas or adding detail to shadows. The A6700 is good in low light, with noise well controlled up to ISO 6400. Images are usable up to ISO 12800, but anything beyond that up to the 51200 limit is for emergency use only. It's best to emphasize shadow capture at high ISOs, as lifting those creates excessive noise. The A6700 is so far above its predecessor for video that it's useless to compare them. Rather, think of it as a cheaper, smaller FX3 cinema camera with the same image quality. It subsamples the full sensor width for 4K at 30 and 60 frames per second, so video is sharper than the X-T5 or R7, especially at 60 frames per second. And the A6700 beats both of those models by having a 4K 120p mode, though it's cropped significantly at 1.58 times. You'll need to be wary of overheating at 120p, and it can also be a problem at 30p and 60p on hot days. 
Like the FX3, you can shoot all video modes with 10-bit S-Log3 capture. You can also load your own LUTs either to make log footage easier to monitor or bake it into the final image. Rolling shutter is still present, so you'll need to be careful with whip pans, fast subjects, and the like. However, it's far less bothersome than on past Sony crop sensor models. It has one video feature that's actually lacking on the FX3, namely auto framing. That's handy for vloggers as it can crop in and follow them as they move around the frame with less quality loss than the ZV-E1. It also offers focus compensation that digitally eliminates breathing. And again, this works better with the extra resolution. Stabilization for video isn't quite as good as the ZV-E1 though. The active mode is fine for handheld use in slow pans, but doesn't do a lot to smooth out footsteps and as a small crop. As for video quality, you're seeing the same accurate colors and solid low light capability as with photos. The 10-bit log options allow for plenty of flexibility in post, especially with contrasty images. The A6700 is easily Sony's best APS-C camera so far, excelling at both photos and video and offering much better handling. Despite being more capable than the A6600, it carries the same $1,400 price. As a photo camera, it's slower than the main competition, the Canon R7 and Fujifilm X-T5, so those models are better for shooting action. Sony's autofocus is slightly better though, and faster bursts are worthless if photos aren't sharp. As a video camera though, it beats its main rivals across the board. All told, it's a great option for content creators or hybrid shooters who favor video but do some photography. If that's you, I'd highly recommend it. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. And for more on technology, check out Engadget.com.